Okay, so thank you for your patience whilst I've been getting started up. Uh, it's really a great pleasure and honor to be with you for these three hours to talk about what I view as one of the most exciting confluences of system science on the one hand and data science on the other that are currently taking place. And that has to do with uh, what is variously called sequential Monte Carlo methods or particle filtering methods. Um, they're almost synonymous. And it, they're used specifically with dynamic models, models that capture the theory of an underlying system and explicate that theory in terms of behavior over time of that system. As I had noted just a few minutes ago, the materials that were being talked about can be understood at many different levels. And one of the challenges uh, associated with uh, making presentations such as this one is really we're talking about five different levels of understanding that can be afforded for these techniques. One of them is the level of philosophy. What does it mean to take a model that characterizes theory about the world and to correct it over time as data comes in? What does it mean to compensate for the shortcomings of that model uh, in light of, of incoming data? How does that change the nature of, of how we use modeling? And there's an interesting set of discussions uh, within that sphere that depending on interest from the participants, uh, we could get, get into in the later part of uh, this morning's session. A second major component, though, that I'm going to really emphasize from the get-go and in an ongoing way is at the level of intuition for kind of rocking, really understanding at the level of your gut what's going on with these techniques sort of uh, how do they work and why do they work um, and what's going on when you particle filter a dynamic model. It turns out there's rich intuition, rich visceral understanding that can come there. You can really grok a particle filtered model as to what's going on and be able to reason about it much more with much more virtuosity as a result. So we're going to be really emphasizing, hammering home this point of intuition. I'm probably, by contrast, only going to get slightly into philosophy. A third level of which these techniques can be understood together is the level of the implementation. How these techniques are actually realized when, when push comes to shove and you want to create a particle filter model. How do you actually create that? And it turns out that how you create it at a detailed level how you implement it, how you software engineer it, reflects two additional levels of understanding. Number one, an understanding at the level of distributions. And finally, the fifth, the fifth level, the understanding of how those distributions are realized in terms of something called sequential importance sampling. Okay? All these levels are valuable, but realistically, during this session, we're going to concentrate on the, the, uh, the second one, the intuition. We're going to make sure that you understand how it's implemented. That's why I provided a, a detailed model showing that. I'd be glad to share with you informally, you know, a half dozen other such models. And uh, as time allows, we'll go into the philosophy aspects of, of uh, the distributions and why those how those distributions are, are realized uh, with sequential importance sampling. Okay, um, I've organized this morning's material deliberately as what I like to call a, a spiral case study. Okay, yeah, spiral, spiral learning. Um, it does include case studies, but it's spiral in the sense that we'll start with sort of the higher level understanding and look at it as applied to some case studies before starting to go into more of the nitty-gritty 
of, of, of how we actually implement these things and then getting into distributions and how we sample from the distributions. What I'm trying to ensure is that anyone here no matter how rusty your understanding of probability theory is and so on, you'll walk away with a pretty rich understanding of what's going on. Those of you who, who do uh, enjoy recourse to diving into the math will go away with a lot. And you'll go away supplemented by a broad set of, of uh, slides that, better than any other resource I know, systematically lay out how these techniques can be used together with, with um, dynamic models, okay? Um, so uh, once again, I would uh, commend to you uh, these materials um, and, uh, and the uh, example model, which is available there for more detailed understanding, okay? So I want to make sure that everyone goes away from here with good understanding during the later part of the session, it's possible that some who are maxed out in the math may say that's enough for me. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'll, I'll leave while, while we go into um, additional mathematics. So mathematics is beautiful, it is compelling, and uh, it is rigorous, but um, uh, there may not be um, an appetite for it amongst everyone, I recognize that. Okay, um, so I'm going to begin by mentioning uh, a little bit about my biases, okay? Um, I'm uh, someone who for over 30 years now, um, since, uh, uh, I guess it's uh, 20, 29, 29 to 30 years now, um, uh, since time between my undergrad and graduate years at MIT, um, I've been exploring the use of system science techniques. Okay. Agent-based modeling, system dynamics modeling, discrete event simulation, and I particularly applied them in the health sphere, and that will inform a lot of uh, what's being talked about here. But for most of that time, since, since the late 90s, certainly, um, I've been extremely interested in informing dynamic modeling on the one hand with what would now be called data science. I took my first course in what's, what would now be called machine learning in the early 90s there as part of my graduate work at MIT. And I, I, I saw a potential for really combining this with the view of system science. And what's emerged over the ensuing decades is of course a flowering of both these fields, particularly in the health sphere, system science, data science. But what's, um, what struck me about that flower is that to a large degree, it's been pursued by somewhat different sociological communities and in a way that uh, if not um, ignorant of one another, don't take full advantages of one another. And so much of my recent work is in the area of data science. Indeed, this afternoon, I'll be speaking about Ethica, our, our, um, our smartphone was and smartphone-based and wearable data collection system, which is a key player within the broader, the broader stage of what we're talking about this morning um, in terms of data science techniques. But I approach data science in a way that's, that has a distinctive perspective on it. And you will see that perspective color, some would say contaminate everything I, I present this morning. And I want to highlight this perspective, not because I think it's the only one out there, not, certainly not, it's probably underrepresented, not because I think it's privileged, although I do think it's actually a very important one, but because it has everything to do with how these techniques are being used here. And it's the perspective of a data scientist who views different data sources, not as solitudes, not as separate, separate um, sources of data to be explored, each in their own way in isolation um, and, and you know, successively worked on. But viewing data sources as different faces, as it were, of an underlying system, where each data source whispers to us about that broader system. And it turns out that if you understand system science and its principles, if you understand 
some of the ideas that have come out of Jenkins and Batting theorem, for example. One of the things it tells us is the high velocity data that's very common in data science. We, we talk about data science, big data being characterized by the four Bs, right? High volume, that's the big. High velocity, the data comes in frequently. High variety and high veracity, and sometimes people add value to it as a 50. When we have high velocity data, it turns out by taking the semantic theorem, it, in that, embedded in that information is information about the state space of the system as a whole that gave rise to it. It's, it's one face of the system, but it whispers to us about the bigger system. And often we will have a given underlying system where we have multiple data sources from different areas of it. Each of them whisper about the system as a whole. And the techniques we'll be talking about today, from a philosophical level, put together those different faces, those different whispers about the system as a whole into a unified picture of what's going on in the underlying system. Any one data source can do it. Multiple data sources can do it with a special richness. And they can illuminate parts of the system about which we have no explicit information, the so-called latent parts of the system. And the, one of the main ways in which they do that is through is by leveraging the dynamic models. Okay, um, so I'm interested in what I like to call systems conscious data science. Data science, which is conscious of the fact that the data is coming from an underlying dynamical system, and it tells us about that system and different sources, different data sets are to be understood often in light of what they whisper to us about the underlying system. So considering health, right? You know, given, given underlying epidemiological situation, health situation, we might have data coming from emergency room presentations, from syndromic surveillance. We might have data coming in from different types of social media, posts people make on Facebook, on Twitter, um, searches that people are doing on Bing or Google, Google search. We might have data from our smartphones, from, from uh, sentinel reporting on, via smartphones or from wearables. And, and together, those tell us a tremendous amount about what's going on in the system. And the foremost techniques I know to put those pieces together to give an understanding of that underlying system are the techniques we'll be talking about this morning. Particle filtering and particle on the same I'm interested in data science, knowing that different data sources whisper to us about the underlying system. I'm also interested in data science from the perspective of someone who's not merely interested in the data that's been collected historically, but often in intervening in that system, which I am conscious will change the data generating process. And um, when we intervene in the system, we often change that process. I'm interested in that underlying system um, and in a capturing causality about the underlying system so we can reason about counterfactuals, especially, and also because of explanatory value and explaining things. And indeed, that's what our dynamic models bring, us, bring to us, is this ability to reason about what-if scenarios, about counterfactual situations. Informed by data, updated by data, corrected by data, but in a way that fundamentally, at any given point, we're informed about where we're at and we can ask what if questions about the future. What if we did this? What if we undertook that intervention? And I have a conviction, as a data scientist, that theory-rich models are important and are hardly uh, just a passing historical era, that they, they will remain uh, of fundamental importance. I'm also interested in models that don't lack, don't currently have a theoretic basis, deep learning models we apply and are very valuable. But we apply them particularly in contexts where we're not dealing about counterfactuals, because if we're dealing about counterfactuals, what if situations that change the underlying data process, we don't know if the associations captured in a deep learning model will persist in that changed context. Okay, so that's a bit about my perspective biases philosophy, but it colors what we're seeing and it informs and motivates what we're seeing. Okay, 
I would note that um, if any of you were looking for additional um, um, uh, slides, uh, this uh, this also has a version of this talks that is that is uh, that is is rich. Okay. Um, the exemplar context I'm going to be talking about today is one that I've alluded to, which is outbreak response and intervention. Okay. It's, it's not that this is the only context. Indeed, we've applied these techniques to dozens of models now, um, many from the communicable disease area, some from the chronic disease area, and certainly from the zoonotic area. Okay? Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, outbreak response, and needing to respond effectively through intervention selection to an unfolding outbreak, where you need to prioritize different intervention strategies, whether it's, it's aspects of, of nearly a human advisory or, um, or uh, outbreak response immunization, such as for measles or pertussis, childhood infectious diseases, um, quarantine, um, shutting down schools, et cetera. Um, this is uh, a common need that plays out over time. And I think it's one of the areas where we can most easily understand what's going on with, with these techniques. So it's one I'll come back to a lot. And the idea here is that you know, over time, we're interested in where are we at with the outbreak? Where is it headed looking forward? What can we do about it? Um, and where are the hidden burdens of infection likely to be that, that haven't led to care presentation, that haven't led to to uh, reporting, official reporting, but might, which, which might drive further, uh, further infection. Okay? Um, and what's notable here is we're interested in early detection and anticipating how it's going to evolve and that often we see notable stochastics. And one of the challenges that's long troubled me about dynamic models is this dichotomy. So for 30 years now, I've been building a, a whole sequence um, of, of models. It's probably in the hundreds now, once you consider the models I built for teaching as well. And what's always troubled me about this is that there's, or for almost from the start, is that there's this, this phase difference between um, this the staggered nature of the work that's kind of artificially divides when we build the model, um, and, and we use it for insight. Um, so we build the model first. We go through this really rigorous process of building it up. And then we use it on an ongoing basis. But often in the meantime, it's becoming somewhat outdated. We've gone through all this calibration. We've gone through all this, this steps to parameterize using the very latest available evidence. And we start to use it. But as soon as we're using it, it's, it's getting obsolete. It's, it's gathering dust, if I can exaggerate it a bit. Um, and often aligning it to new data is a fairly manual process. We can do it. We could reparameterize. We could recalibrate based on the latest data six months hence. But it, it kind of takes often suspending the work and going through this, this large effort. Um, so that's one reflection that often we're, we have this kind of disjunction between when we pursue one and when we pursue the other. And often our models start to become outdated. But the other is almost a philosophical issue. So look, as we say about models, all models are wrong, some are useful. George Bach said it, right? He was referring predominantly to statistical models, but he had a broad understanding that, that, that a dome breaks outside that area. Um, and all models are wrong, some are useful, and it's of the nature of modeling that it's useful precisely because it's a simplification. Okay? It's a simplification of a much richer external world that inevitably omits some things, approximates some things, poorly approximates certain things, um, uh, aggregates certain things, um, and often when we build a model, our understanding is just being formed, and over time we gather and build build a new model. But at any one time, often our models are have a lot of issues in characterizing um, the underlying system. And even the very best of models, let's suppose you could have a model that precisely characterizes a system. So it's it's 
you know, exactly characterizing the underlying dynamics of, of the systems um, processes. Typically, we're dealing with stochastic systems, systems that have factors that that are outside our control. Often, they are exogenous to the model, but influence it. And it's not possible, even if we correctly characterize that the character of that stochastic process, the distributions. It's not possible for us to know exactly what way those stochastic chances will go. Whether whether there's uh, you know, a chance uh, super spreader uh, that spreads it to a set of others because they're at a, a conference event, um, or, or whether it ends up going into a period of, of, of lower transmission, for example. And as a result, even the very best of models will often exhibit divergence uh, in its particulars from what we observe in the world. Um, so we may calibrate a model early on, shown here in, in, in uh, its results in terms of the blue there. And over time, we'd like it to align with the data. And perhaps we have a very good model, a model that was built with the very latest evidence. But increasingly, there's, there's these various stochastics that take place in the system that we didn't anticipate. So we built the model here, and we run it, and we project out. And until we go back and re-examine those models' assumptions and, um, and parameters and recalibrate it, it's going to be projecting things that are increasingly stale, right? And we can't go back, and we should go back, because models are learning tools, uh, if best used. We can't go back and, and update it, but it's a fairly heavyweight process traditionally. So the solution vision here at a broad level, one that I've been pursuing for uh, now several decades at some level, is look, building quickly, quickly formulated and frequently regrounded models. Models that can be built at a quick level early on, say within an outbreak, but that can be regrounded automatically as new evidence comes in. Regrounded with, with new data, with new understanding, um, uh, rather than um, requiring a lot of manual effort. Okay? Um, but the idea here is, look, don't, don't just rely on, on model predictions. Don't just create a model and then use it in a blindfolded way, but, um, but update it on an ongoing basis. The model sta state is kept current with the latest evidence. So it can project forward and, and understand intervention trade-offs in light of that evidence. Um, and as we'll see, the model structure, the logic of the model, together with the time series, ends up illuminating areas of the system where you don't have data. It would be as if you know, people are, if we saw a huge, you know, a, a very fast flow of people through this door, all we're observing is this flow through this door. But I would argue it tells me something about what's going on out there. There must be a lot of people out in the area outside there. I don't have data explicitly about that, but the logic of my mental model is such that these people are coming from a, a stock of people out there that must be actually quite crowded, okay? So the example I, I would like to use here, it's, it's an intuitionist look. Um, some of you are visiting Washington, um, and at the end of the week, you'll have a very good understanding of how to get from here, which may have been challenging to get to this morning, back to your hotel, or back to your domicile if you live here. You have a very good mental model, perhaps an excellent mental model, and you rely on that mental model to go back and forth. But it's an entirely different picture in terms of reliability if you were to do so blindfolded. You have a very good mental model, but can't you get from here back to your hotel? Yeah, in broad terms, but you'd probably end up not surviving the trip. You wouldn't know when the lights are turned. You wouldn't know, you know when, when your mental model of where the curb is is slightly off. You wouldn't know about that open manhole cover or exactly where that entrance to subway is. So when we're dealing with mental models, when we're dealing with our understanding of the world, 
those models can be superior in, in terms of broad elements, but it would be a fool's errand. It would be complete madness to try to navigate the world based purely on those models. We depend on at least occasional observations. And even if you, like me, sometimes walk on the sidewalk like this, looking at the map, you've got to occasionally look up to see where you're at to make sure you're not veering off or, or going to hit someone, etc. So the idea is, look, day-to-day -day life, we typically deal with models not by putting all our faith in them and just in a blindfolded way following them, but we have occasional input. And that occasional input, even if once every 30 seconds or once every 15 seconds when you look up, makes all the world of difference. And the techniques that we're going to be talking about today at an intuition level do exactly that. They, they let our models peek at the world and update its understanding of where we're at. Right? Just how if we had to get back to our hotel, if we could do that every 15 seconds or 30 seconds, we'd make it back fine. We'd make it back fine. Um, because we'd update our understanding of where we're at and correct our future planning. That's, that's really what's going on here with, with particle filtering. I'd like to use another analogy. Again, trying to build up this intuition, although we'll see the intuition ends up going much deeper than this. The other intuition is, is for a weather report. Um, imagine the situation. So weather reports these days are pretty effective for, for, for capturing aspects of you know, the weather in the next uh, 12 hours and even sometimes the next day. Um, weather reports um, uh, offer you know, incredible utility to our day-to-day -day lives because the weather models in which they're built are, are actually quite good, very detailed uh, characterizations of the meteorological processes. But imagine if we relied on weather reports only created as of January 1st of every year. They're created January 1st and they project forward for the rest of the year. It would be madness, right? I mean, here we are, early July, and no matter how good those models were as of uh, January 1st, you know, things have happened since then that, that its prediction till now is not going to be able to take into account. If we're relying on the predictions of a stale model, those predictions are increasingly outdated. And of course, with weather reports, it would be madness for meteorolo meteorological models to do that. Instead, they're constantly updated with what has come about now. So there was unexpected high pressure um, that, that swept through the area, and the model got updated uh, to reflect it. Um, and, and it projects forward for tomorrow based on not just a model and a very good model structure, but what's actually happened today. And as a result, it's much more accurate than the model itself taking an open loop, blindfolded, that would have projected back in January. So what we're doing here today is, is really taking our models and putting them into this sort of context. It's taking our models and turning them into something like weather reports where they're always regrounded in the current situation, and that's used to project forward. It's not that the model is is uh, fundamentally flawed. It's just it can't know what stochastic effects are going to happen, and it inevitably omits things. And so we're always, we, we can just, whenever we have data, we reground it. It's just we're taking off our blindfolds from our models. That's what this is about at the very highest level. So the idea here is that we're seeking an approach that, that allows us to, to move beyond purely running a model out in, in this sort of way, in an open loop sort of way, no matter what happens, you know, we have some older model prediction that's increasingly stale. And we'd like to learn over time as new data comes in. And this issue of learning from the data, using it to sharpen our understanding of what's going on in the system and through PMCMC, the parameter values, what it tells us about parameter values is central to the um, uh, central to the to the goals here. Okay, so um, 
Uh, here we're learning from data historically, and maybe we're at this point here about time 120, and we want to look forward in light not just of the model structure as it was back here, model parameters as it were here, but in light of all this learning. And we'd like to project forward what's likely to happen, but not just that, we'd like to understand at time 120 what's the underlying situation in the system? What's the latency? state? How many how many people out there that are probably exposed but not yet infective? So they won't have gone to level, perhaps they're not past their incubation period, through their incubation period, and so they haven't presented for care yet, um, or, and they're not yet uh, transmitting past their late, their, uh, their latent period, and they're not past their incubation period. Um, uh, alternatively, um, maybe we're interested in how many recovered people there are out there, or how many people that are, that are immune um, through recovery or vaccination. We'd like to be able to estimate the latent state and to do so with various uh, factors that we don't directly observe. So this is what we're seeking, a model that learns over time, uses these observations to correct the model's understanding, and uh, in light of that, updated understanding projects forward. Okay, that's in the very broadest terms. If you go away with that intuition, um, you'll have gotten somewhere and understand where these techniques fit in. Are these techniques about models? Yes, they're about models. They, they, the, the dynamic models capture the underlying theory of the system in a way that their, their strengths are still preserved here, but they are not taken in isolation. They are taken um, in a fashion that, that takes into account the observations from the system. So we're going to talk about today a set of techniques that take advantage of these. The main one we're going to be talking about is particle filtering. Uh, but as time allows, we'll get into MCMC and particle MCMC because these take the advantages of particle filtering to another level yet. And all of these are techniques we've implemented to good effect with dynamic models. Our models um, uh, include a, a wide variety of them here. Lugia here um, has been responsible for, for some of the work, particularly around the, the chickenpox modeling, but also for our particle MCMC implementation and taking the performance of that much further with uh, GPU uh, enablement. Um, We've, we've applied these to, to many, um, uh, many infectious conditions, but also conditions like opioids um, and, uh, and tuberculosis that's both infectious and chronic disease, as well as some health service delivery issues, some more biomedical uh, dynamics issues, and um, some components having to do with cognate areas like uh, uh, community safety and well-being. Um, okay. I'm going to talk about particle filtering as a technique, some of its strengths, some of its characteristics, and uh, we're going to talk about really what is it you're doing and take a look at a, a few case studies. And then we'll start to go into a little bit more detail what's going on. Okay, so particle filtering is a technique that um, uh, stands um, within a family of techniques known as filtering methods. And these methods go back many, many years. Um, the most prominent of them, which emerged roughly mid-20th century, is the Coleman filter. And the Coleman filter is a filter that all of you have relied on quite heavily at one point or another. And I'll just mention a few examples. If you took a flight here, if you took a flight to DC, like me, Almost certainly the plane was guided by a common filter in place, uh, either direct or extended or colored and various variants of it, but it was a common filter. If you used a smartphone and you used GPS system to get here, you used a common filter. The smartphones commonly incorporate common filters now as a, as a routine matter, as do G, you know the uh, Garmin systems in cars, et cetera. Okay? So, um, this is a uh, well-established method. It has some beautiful mathematics associated with it. But it has some real limitations. It's really best designed for systems where you have very rapid incoming data, like many times a second or every few seconds. And you're seeking to update 
your understanding in a very parsimonious way. By parsimonious, I'm talking about a computationally frugal way. And in order to achieve that, it has very strict distributional assumptions. The assumption is that noise within the system is normally distributed, and the system is, to the extent common filter, linearizable. That's a mouthful, but essentially, typically, we are dealing in infectious diseases of necessity with um, nonlinear models, models whose behavior over time depends on the state of the model. For example, your probability if you're susceptible of getting infected in the next day depends, it's not just some fixed constant, it depends on how many people are infected out there. Um, and that's the mark of nonlinearity. And common filtering to deal with that linearizes the system around a certain, its best understanding of what the system situation is now. Now, and the problem is if that understanding, that privileged understanding, that MLE, maximum likelihood estimate, is off, it would change the linearization. And so often, um, common filtering can perform very well in near linear systems. For nonlinear systems, it can get totally disconnected from reality. Okay? Um, um, much as certain politicians can get totally disconnected from reality sometimes. Um, and uh, within this context, the, the distributional assumptions can be really problematic. Assuming the normal distribution for a state which could be in either the state or that state very plausibly um, is infeasible. And so it ends up um, performing fairly poorly for, uh, for uh, nonlinear systems. Um, it has this reliance on linearization that's problematic there. And um, uh, common filtering is something which um, uh, is very well suited when you have data coming in frequently because it can be performed within hundreds of milliseconds at most. Okay? Um, the techniques we're going to be looking at, particle filtering, are very well suited to epidemiological time scales, where you might have data arriving one, multiple times a day, maybe even data arriving multiple times an hour, but, but you can still you can still do the requisite calculations uh, within the time frames needed to incorporate new data points. Common filtering is widely used for airplane avionics, uh, missiles, rockets, etc., where you're getting data very, very, very frequently. Um, okay, so common filtering is, is worthwhile at, to think about as an, as an alternative. I won't go into it here, but if you're interested, you could, you could take a look. And it's kind of a, the granddaddy of the techniques we're talking about today. But the techniques we're talking about today are much more powerful, but more computationally demanding. Um, uh, particle filtering doesn't have any requirement for linearization. This is extremely important because it means we can use amongst other things with agent-based models, with discrete event simulation models. We're not depending on having a system specified in a fashion that can be linearized mathematically. Okay? Um, the techniques we're talked about today can be very valuable. It's, it's important to understand. When I say that the data whispers to us about the underlying system, it's not the fact that each data point tells us about a broad area of the system in, in, un, in explicit forms. Each data point is typically highly ambiguous. But putting them together, multiple data points, one after the other, and different types of data often tell us comprehensively about many areas of the system. And particle filtering can incorporate diverse types of information, and it's especially well suited to high velocity data, streaming data. Okay? Um, so, a few key points about how this works. Okay? I'm going to give you a few pointers here. One, particle filtering is used to good effect if you have a stochastic model. If you have a model, which has some sort of stochastics in it. These stochastics are typical for many classes of system science models. Agent-based models, discrete event simulations are almost without exceptions um, stochastic. There are exceptions. Conway's game of life is deterministic, for example. But most agent-based simulations characterizing human behavior, for example, 
the province of this conference. Um, you have stochastic elements because people's behavior tends not to be deterministic. Um, and particle filtering is used in contrast to something like MCMC with, with models that are, are stochastic. Now, the simulation model within particle filtering, for, for the most part, you're running it in a typical fashion. Each particle, as it turns out, is going to run the simulation model for, for periods of time in a, per, in a, in a totally typical fashion, a, a, a traditional fashion. Each particle is going to have a complete theory, a complete hypothesis for what's going on in the world, and it's just going to run out the logical consequences of that hypothesis using the typical model between observations. At a time of an observation is where the difference is. Between observations, you're just running this model for every particle. At observations, it's going to be corrected. It's going to be, it's like that blindfold's removed. And you see where you are, and that's where you go, oh, oh, I'm here. Oh, um, I, I should have been going more to the left. And, and you know, the blindfold goes back on until you get the new data point, but you start heading so much to the left to correct for it, right? Um, so here, the model is, is being corrected episodically as new data comes in. Between those times, you're just running the model in the normal way for every single part. Okay. Um, this process is performed recursively in an online fashion. For some, you might recognize those terms. So when a new data point comes in, it doesn't require us to go back and compute to consider all previous data points when asking what's our current situation. All we do is we take the results that we, as we had understood them later, and we update them with the understanding from the latest data point. We don't have to re-go back and reconsider all the earlier data. And that's why we say it's recursive. The, the current situation gets updated in a way that uses the results of the earlier one but it doesn't go back and, and successively reconsider all the earlier data points. Particle filtering works by sampling from an underlying distribution. And during the later parts of this session, we may get to what that distribution is. Um, there's going to be a proposal distribution and a target distribution. And the target represents the posterior distribution associated with the model um, conditional on all the data that's been, been observed, okay, for a given time. But here, we're going to be dealing with samples from a distribution. We're, we're not dealing with one privileged estimate, an MLE estimate that says this is the single most likely value, the single most likely situation right now. Instead, we're going to be dealing with the distribution of possible situations that could be applying in the underlying system right now. So at a certain time, we're going to deal with the possibility maybe there's some, you know, a large number of people infected in the population and comparatively few uh, susceptibles. Or maybe there's more susceptibles, lots of exposed individuals and comparatively few infected individuals. We'll have these different, this distribution of different possibilities we're dealing with. And those, we're doing so with these samples. And these are discrete samples from that distribution. And each sample is going to be called a particle. Each, each particle represents a hypothesis about what's currently the situation right now in the world. Okay? It's a sample from a distribution of possibilities for the situation right now. Some possibilities are more likely, some are less likely. Okay? And it turns out that these particles, which represent these hypotheses about the situation right now in the world, um, are not just of equal pedigree. Particles are labeled by a weight. And you have to consider the particle in light of the weight. And the weight represents the level of representation of that particle's value in the distribution, okay? Or the representation of that particle in the distribution. So if one particle is a weight of two and one particle is a weight of one, the particle with the weight of two is twice as it's worth, it, it's like two of them for every one of the other, okay? Um, 
it, so it's twice as, as populated, uh, twice as, as prevalent within the, uh, the population of possibilities. So we need to deal with particles always in terms of their weight. And indeed, when we look at particles, it doesn't make sense to just look at all particles per se. We sample from the particles with a probability according to the weight, according to the notion of importance sampling. So this whole technique is built on importance sampling. In the later part of the session, we may get to how that plays a role. But fundamentally, it allows us to go from a, from a, uh, a, a basic um, proposal distribution to a target distribution. Okay? Um, the particles. I noted represent these competing hypotheses to these different states. So there's some situation in the world out there, and the particles represent different hypotheses for what's going on out there. And they're competing. They're jockeying for understanding about which is the which you know which hypotheses are, are likely to be best for what's going on out there in the world. We have some situation where we don't observe directly. We don't have the luxury of knowing exactly what it is. But we get these whispers from data as it comes in. And those whispers are cluing us in to what's going on in the world. And the particles represent different jockeying hypotheses for what's going on, where the weights over time are going to reflect how consistent that particle is with the data. So we're going to reward particles that are more consistent with data as it comes in by upping their weights. We're going to say that's a plausible hypothesis, you know, and we're going to, and, and that's going to be reflected in a higher weight. Others that are not very consistent with the data will have their weights downgraded, and those will be viewed as less plausible hypotheses, and therefore they're less represented in the distribution. The distribution we'll be capturing will. Well, we'll put more emphasis on hypotheses that are more likely, therefore that have higher weight, and less on those with lower weight. Okay? And that's what the weight is going to be doing. And you can think of these as competing hypotheses. And this is a key intuition, an absolutely key intuition, ladies and gentlemen. This is survival of the fittest of the particles. The particles have different competing hypotheses, and those that are fit as judged by their weights, as judged by consistency with the evidence as it comes in. They are positing hypotheses about what's going on that turn out to, to be aligned with each new data point. It's consistent with it. Their weights will grow and they will multiply. There's kind of a, 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 a genetic almost component to it. They will be multiplied. They'll be fruitful and they'll multiply. The ones that are not very consistent with the incoming data, their weights will shrink and they're likely to die out. So there's a very real survival of the fittest. And how do we judge fitness? By consistency with the incoming data. So each hypothesis, each particle is going to have a hypothesis for the situation. In light of that hypothesis, that it thinks there's this many effectives, that many successes that many exposed, that many recovers. Each new data point is going to say, how consistent is that hypothesis that it thinks the tons of infected that nobody was reported as infected this, this time period? Well, that's very unlikely to have occurred, and its weight will be digged. It will be, be given a lower weight, and if it's, if it's off base many times, it will tend to die out. Those that are consistent will tend to flourish will tend to be highly represented. And those highly represented hypotheses will be the ones that, that survive and, and that are the, the competitive hypotheses. The, those are the ones that are fit. And those are the ones that will, that will allow the model to emerge with a better understanding for what's going on, to, be, to have its understanding crafted, have its understanding um, sharpened or honed by the incoming data so that it can then predict forward. It's kind of like, imagine if you were going with a blindfold on, you might have, am I here or am I, am I to the left of the stairs or right of the stairs? You have two competing hypotheses in your mind. Maybe it's because you don't remember where the stairs were in this building or maybe it's because you're not quite 
sure how many steps you, you've walked. And then you remove the blindfold for a second peek. And oh, I'm to the right of stairs. That hypothesis, other hypothesis dies out. Now you put all your effort in that hypothesis which survives. That's a survival of the fittest. And it's just like that for what's going on. OK, so let me talk about, at the end of the day, so you could walk out of here and say, I basically know how particle filtering can be implemented. I want to give you the gist of it, OK? So you can go and, and say, OK, I've, I've, I've gotten some the key understanding about, about how to implement it. So the basic idea is this. We start with a uh, stochastic model. We have to have model. I'm going to talk here about ODEs, or in a differential equation models. Uh, these are sock and flow models, uh, for those who are comfortable with, with that term from Sysmodynamics, compartmental models, as it's used in mathematical epidemiology. But it turns out what I'm going to be talking about here pretty much applies, I mean, it, it applies to agent-based models as well. And I'll talk later in the session about agent-based models and, and perform part of which we've done. Okay, so you start with a model that's stochastic. Okay, um, you basically subscript this model. So you create almost a copy of the model for each of hundreds to thousands of different particles. If you're dealing with agent based models, which are really large state spaces, you might be dealing with tens of thousands of models, uh, tens of thousands of particles. But the basic deal is, for each particle, you have a complete copy of the model. I mean, strike you as odd, but the idea is, look, each particle needs to evolve separately from the others. Okay? Um, and, you know, if you're dealing with system on MX package and, and system on MX models, you just use subscripts. But, you know, so they run in parallel. This, this particle evolves separately from that one. Um, at any given time, each particle is a certain state of the model involved. And over time, they evolve independently, except in observations. And that's when there's this kind of jockeying and survival of the fittest that goes on. Okay? So you're going to have a different copy of the model for each of the particles. Okay? Um, anything that can differ between the stochastic realizations um, needs to have it's, it, it, so it's each particle has to have a separate version of that, okay? Um, and then you, you'll get a sample from the initial model state according to some prior distribution for the, the state of the model at the start, okay? Um, and often there's a certain amount of artful tuning that goes into this, okay? Turns out that, that like how you start the model off often has a pretty significant impact on what the distributions that are seen for, for, a, for a while. And so you want to be a little bit careful picking that prior art distribution over the initial state. What do I mean by distribution? Well, some, some particles might pause an initial state that looks like one thing. Others pause at a different initial state. You're not putting all your eggs in one basket, all your eggs in, in a single understanding. OK, then look, between observations, all the particles evolve according to the standard model dynamic. It's the typical model dynamics. It's as if you're just running for each particle, you're just running the standard model. That particle just goes forward according to the standard logic of the model. If it's an agent based model, you're just running it forward for the entire agent based model according to its understanding of the current situation. If, if it's an ODE model, each of those each of those different layers for each particle is just running forward, okay? And the particle weights remain the same. There's no change in the particle weights. Particle weights are the same. There's no new data that's come in to update our understanding of which particle is more plausible than another. And so the weights all stay precisely the same. Okay. Um, and then the magic happens at this observation point, okay? Um, and the associated with resampling. So at the observation point, for each particle, there's going to be a, a consequence or a, um, an assessment, an evaluation of that particle. And specifically, the metric we're going to use to evaluate the fitness of that particle, how good its understanding is, is the likelihood function. Okay? 
So the particle is going to posit this is the situation right now in the world. And in our evaluation, we're going to say, so you think that's what's going on in the world, eh? How likely, if that's going on in the world, is it that you would see this, this observation, this new observation? And we have to compute a likelihood of seeing this new observation, which could be a single observation. It could be a vector of observations. You know, we see this many reports with, on Facebook. We see this many reports on Twitter. We see this many searches for flu-related things. We see this many cases from syndromic surveillance reports. We see this many emergency room presentations. We can, could compute the likelihood of, of that vector for that particle, um, often just multiplication out of simpler likelihoods. But the fundamental thing is, we compute the likelihood of observing this empirical observation, or observation vector, given the particle state. So each particle, at a certain point, right now, at this time, that particle posits something is going on in the world. That's what models do of this sort, dynamic models. They posit, for this situation right now, this is the case. And we compute that likelihood of observing with these new set of data. And we will then use that to multiply by the particle weight. Okay? Now, what does that mean? Well, if, if that particle has a higher likelihood of observing this, this type of observed data, the data was in fact empirically observed, its weight will grow. Mm -hmm. Its weight will become larger. By contrast, if it if this is a particle of things, there's no infected people out there. Everyone's already recovered. The susceptibles is very low. There's no infected people out there to speak of. And we get a, a report, case reports from confirmed cases of a thousand uh, emergency room presentations that are confirmed with lab tests. The likelihood of observing that is close to zero. And its weight will be multiplied by something close to zero, and its weight will plummet. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to re we're going to um, renormalize the weights to the sum to one. Okay, that's just a detail, but but a, a valuable detail in the implementation. So all the weights will be will sum up to one. So some particles will have some weights that are very high, like 0.7, 2. Those are very competitive particles. Others might have weights that are close to zero. And then often depending on what's called the effective sample size, which basically uh, is going to take into account if, if <laughs> we have tons of particles that are very low weights, we're really not, we're, we're not sampling very well, effectively, very efficiently from the distribution. If the effective sample size is too, is too low, there's too much disparity of weights, then basically we have this survival of the fittest. There's a, a winnowing going on that goes on and basically we reproduce particles with a probability of, of being selected according to their weight. So what this leads to is those with low weights following this observation point disappear, tend to disappear. So if this particle had a low weight of 0 0.001, its chance of being drawn, if we're drawing 100 particles to go on, is very, very low. Um, a particle whose weight was 0.5 might get drawn several, many times among these hardware particles. And it will get drawn, you know, 45 times or something like that. And it will be very well represented. So no, some of these particles can get multiplied many times over. But the ones with low weights, they might totally die out. They won't even get sand at this resampling step. So this is part of the survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest really occurs at two conceptual levels. One is the weight is dinged if the particle is inconsistent. It's enhanced if it's consistent. And that weight really represents the level of representation of the particle and the distribution. Um, but it's really at this resampling step that it's at its most um, it's at its most dramatic because particles that have very low weight are likely to die out. They don't even continue. Their lineage ends. Those that are 
have pi weight will be multiplied and will go on um, to evolve. And you'll notice that these particles that are multiplied here, these three atop each other, they go on and, and I show at time t, they all have the same value. After all, they were multiplied, they were duplicated. This, this hypothesis, which seems so plausible, is really up. Just like when we moved that blindfold, we saw it to the words on the right of the stairs. That hypothesis becomes like the dominant one. Um, but then over time, as, as we take more steps, our understanding starts to diverge again. Because of stochastics, maybe we're here, maybe we're there. And what was one unified hypothesis starts to diverge because its model is stochastic. Does that make sense? Model is stochastic. So what was one hypothesis that, that became highly represented, it was multiplied many times, it diverges because model is stochastic. And some of these will then be more consistent with subsequent data at time t plus 1 and some of less. Okay? So that's basically what's, that's, uh, that's how particle filtering works. You can all go home now. Um, so, so each, so the model, we have separate copies of the model for each particle. And that model runs uninterrupted between observations. At observations, we take this weight and we multiply it by the likelihood. It becomes bigger if, if the likelihood of observing the empirical data uh, is, is high for a given particle becomes lower and it becomes low weight if, if that particle is unlikely to observe the, uh, the empirical data. And, and there's this winnowing down at resampling, survival of the fittest. And whenever we sample the particles, like to plot out what's going on in the model, we will do so in a way that we draw from it proportional to the weight. We always, we never draw from the particles without drawing from them according to their weight because it's meaningless. The particles need to be considered in light of their weight or something that has a weight of two is twice as represented as something the weight of one, okay? So if we want to draw the distribution, we have to sample from particles according to their weight. Uh, probably drawing a particle is proportional to its weight. And that's very easily done and captured in that model. And then finally, I'm going to mention something of great significance. What I've been talking about will give the distribution at any one time for what the situation is. At this time, the situation is such and such, according to the distribution of particles by weight. Right? So if you look at particles by weight, we can draw from them with the probability of getting each according to its it's uh, its weight, and and we're we're drawing with replacement, so we might get the same particle multiple times. If it has very high weight, that's fine, um, and that approximates the distribution at a given time. But particle filtering gives us more than the distribution at any one time. It gives us distribution over trajectories, which really means distribution over the story of what's happened over time, because a particle has associated with it, a lineage. It has a parent. It has a parent. It has a mother. It has a grandmother. It has a great-grandmother. And so on back. And at any one time, it can trace back, my grandmother was this particle, and at that time, you know, my value was this. And, and my great-grandmother was this particle, and therefore at this time my value was such and such. And it goes all the way back. And it can trace back a lineage of what this particle thinks was the case over time at different points of time. And it turns out that you can accomplish that by sampling from the uh, these lineages by sampling the particle at the final time and you're basically all you have to do is keep track of what's called the ancestry makes matrix what particle was the was the parent of another particle and so on all the way back and you can then sample from the final particles to the final time and use that to um, to, to reconstruct whole trajectories okay so be as if um, the situation now 
tells us, so imagine if there was um, a, a big outbreak uh, that occurred for um, measles in Tennessee, you know, um, uh, this week. <clears throat> that would tell us about the situation in Tennessee right now, and, and as new data comes in, would tell us what was going on. But it would also imply something what was going on a year ago. <laughs> if there was an outbreak this year, probably there were quite a few susceptible people who were around a year ago, even, or six months ago. It would whisper to us about the situation previously. And that's the idea of sampling from trajectories, OK? Um, so, so that's the idea. So I'd like to, I will welcome comments and, and, and questions in just a minute. But because I want to um, give a, a very concrete sense of this, I want to present quickly uh, one or two examples, OK? So here's an example. It's a published paper. Um, came out uh, in, um, in PLUS One. Um, and it's based on another paper in PLUS One from Josh Epstein and Ross Hammond and others. Uh, and this had to do with the coupled contagion of what they call fear and disease. And the idea here is, look, um, outbreaks have not just elements of patent and transmission, but psychosocial dimension, too. There's concerns people have during outbreaks about, about the spread of infection. And they built a model, which was actually, curiously, um, given their agent-based model, uh, an ODE model. And it posited a set of connections here um, um, between states associated with with uh, infection with pathogen and those in infected with anxiety. So individuals could be susceptible and they could get infected and then recovered in a traditional sense. But alternatively, they could be infected as it were. There was a contagion of anxiety. So they could become afraid and they could engage in social distancing and sort of take themselves out of circulation and become susceptible again. Um, for example, upon becoming afraid, they could still get infected in some cases, et cetera. And we took this model, and um, in a, this model has some ODEs associated with it, we won't go into, that are implicit in the stock and flow structure. And we uh, supplemented this model with some factors that reflected uh, stochastics. So, um, some variability in contacts per day, um, a removal rate from scared to self-isolated, where we had some uncertainties associated with that. Um, the, uh, report, the reporting rate, um, and uh, separately, to relate it to um, uh, search trends, um, searching prevalence. And the idea is that we wanted to look at historic data of two types. One was uh, data from Manitoba on uh, clinical cases. Um, so these were hospital admissions, ICU admissions, um, and reported cases through the healthcare system due to presentation. And what we were interested in looking at is, what if we supplemented this, this type of data, which is comparatively higher quality data, with data drawn from social media or from search queries? Okay, um, and specifically we're interested in looking online at search volumes. Um, this is searching for influenza in Canada over time, and we're dealing with this period of time here. Um, this is the 2009-2010 flu pandemic, um, and particularly we are dealing with the deuxième vague, the second wave of it, okay, in, in Quebec and in Manitoba. Um, and if you look at Google search and clinic calls um, over time for Manitoba, for example, um, you find uh, characteristic trends that, that cross over between different keywords associated with uh, searches. And what we posited was that, that um, while the clinical data 
related to individuals drawing infective um, through any of these different pathways, whether becoming afraid simultaneously or becoming infected from already being afraid or, or becoming uh, infective without um, a level of, of high anxiety as well. Um, we, we, we argued that um, the clinical cases were probably reflective of, of these transitions, okay? Um, by contrast, search behavior, we argued, was probably due to, in many cases, not all, but in many, to uh, levels of concern or anxiety that might reflect these transitions here, okay? Um, there were bigger uncertainties associated with that, um, but we could capture those in our likelihood functions. Um, and we formulated a likelihood function that related the empirical data concerning searching and concerning clinical cases to these flows and to these flows, okay? Um, so essentially, each particle had a complete copy of this model. So what that means is at a given time, if you consider for a given particle, it posits there's a certain number of susceptibles right now in the population, a certain number of infectives right now, a certain number of recoveries right now, a certain number of those afraid. Each particle has a complete hypothesis for the current situation of all. And they're jockeying for position in terms of the uh, effectiveness of those, uh, those hypotheses. But the idea is that, um, that we're computing a likelihood that given the current situation that a given is, is posited by a given particle, what's the likelihood we would see this many people searching, for example, uh, online? Because the state of the particle implies certain values for these flows. Some particles might posit a state where we have very, very few people, for example, susceptible, and very low rates of search behavior. Um, and uh, given, given anxiety. And if, if we had a particle that posited that, and we had large volumes of searching going on right now um, involving influenza, that would be, uh, have a, a, high, a low likelihood associated with it and uh, the particle's weight will be downgraded as a result. By contrast, um, some particles might posit lots of susceptibles and a fairly high propensity to search if uh, engaged in anxiety, in which case that particle might posit a large number of people searching right now and, and be correspondingly have its weight uh, rise if we in fact see a large number of people searching. So the idea here is we have some empirical datum, we have some model particle specific model state at the current time, and we compute this likelihood. And common distributions for that um, are listed as follows. We've explored, I think, all of these. Um, but uh, what we actually observed used here was uh, what's called the negative binomial distribution. Okay. And I can talk about why that is later, if, if time allows. But basically, this is a variant to the binomial distribution that's just a little bit more uh, tolerant and less, uh, less fragile. So the idea here is, look, um, uh, we have this likelihood function. And to represent the fact that the data has different pedigrees associated with it, um, different levels of confidence, we can capture with what's called the dispersion parameter a level of give associated with the likelihood function. How, how tolerant are we of being off, as it were? And um, we use this negative binomial, so I'll give you a sense of what that looked like. Uh, we have this dispersion parameter. It's termed R in statistical terms. Uh, the negative binomial distribution is a closed variant to the Pascal distribution, which has a slightly different parameterization. But this is with r equal 1. This is with r equal 2. And in, in all these cases I'm going to be showing, the mean is going to be, mu is going to be 1,000. So this is the mean. And you notice with r equal 1, dispersion parameter 1, it looks geometric distribution. This is like a geometric distribution. 
It's a variant to the exponential distribution. This is two, okay? You could start to see a bit of a central tendency emerging. Here's, here's four, doubling it, doubling the dispersion parameter. Again, the mean is still 1,000, and all these, the mean is 1,000, but we're just changing the dispersion parameter. Here's 128, and we used, I'd have to remember, I think we used, uh, I remember one of them was an R of 40. Um, so it's a fairly narrow distribution. And what is this, what is this telling us? I mean, okay, so likelihood function, what's it really telling us? Well, basically, if we use a likelihood function that's distributed negative binomially, let's suppose we actually predict, um, from the current model state, we think 1,000 cases is most likely. Um, but we actually see, you know, 2,000. This is going to say it's vanishingly small. That, that this particle would observe, given the, the particle's positive state of the underlying situation in the model, of the underlying situation in the world, it, it's almost inconceivable that that particle would observe, that that state of the world would yield this observable. Um, and therefore, we would give it a likelihood of close to zero, and therefore, its weight will be multiplied by the likelihood, and therefore, we get a very low weight. Mm -hmm. By contrast, if we had a particle that posited based on its, its underlying state, um, a thousand people is likely to be, uh, to be reported as, an, as or performing a search. And we actually observed, let's say, 750 uh, people over here. It would have a, a small but not totally dismissible likelihood of occurring. Um, something like uh, sev uh, something like um, 900 would be somewhere up here. Okay, and so we would. This is proportional to the to the likelihood here. Um, and the interesting thing that came from this, which is a rather provocative result, but one which would make sense to those some of those familiar with machine learning approaches, uh, big data, is that that. Adding, so if we consider two situations, one where we consider only the higher quality data, here lab confirmed cases, let's say, of influenza, or clinically confirmed cases of influenza, less plausibly, um, but good, good quality data from presenting individuals. And we compare that to something like search data. In terms of the traditional health hierarchy of evidence, that, that pyramid, you know, where RCTs sit at the, the very pinnacle and, and many people's vaunted eyes. Um, uh, I, I'm not one who believes strongly in, in, in them having a pr totally privileged position at all, but, but in many people's notion in health, there's this hierarchy of evidence, right? It's a common concept. And these are, these are data from very different points within the hierarchy of evidence, clinically confirmed or lab confirmed test cases versus search data, which is big uncertainty. Why are people searching? Is it the same hyperactive individual searching 100 times, or is it different people searching? Very different levels of, of pedigree. Um, but what we found is that if we use just the highlight, just the, the more rigorous data, um, the, the data that was uh, drawn from, um, from uh, stronger evidence, um, we really couldn't forecast very well what happened going forward. Here the model was learning over time from the observations. Its, its weights were being um, honed by these observations, so it's being corrected. And here we are at the current time, model time 35, and we're trying to predict forward. The model you'll notice here predicts a broad swath of possibilities within the next week. And it's even worse when it comes to predicting search behavior in the next week. It quickly becomes quite uncertain how many people will be infected, how many people would be, um, would be searching. By contrast, if we combine in the data from search behavior, so the model learns from search behavior, even though that data is lower quality, even though 
and it probably has bigger error bars associated with it. It may be associated with a larger R value, a, uh, sorry, a smaller R value, a greater dispersion, essentially. Um, because it's an independent source of data, because it, it tells us something else about the underlying system, it actually allows us to predict with much greater confidence what's likely to happen, not just in terms of search, searching, but in terms of clinical cases. Now that, that could be a bit provocative, adding, you might think, you know, if you have only high quality data, how can adding low quality data help? And the answer is, of course, from an information perspective, it's adding new information, it's adding different information. And together with the model, which understands the underlying logic of the situation, that information tells you a lot about what's going on in the system about how many people out there are probably concerned, tells you a sense about how many people might get sick, etc. So adding in lower quality information here as a new data source can actually help our predictions quite a lot about what's likely to happen, not only in terms of the thing we're observing with lower data quality, but, but in terms of, of, of things such as new infections. And it turns out this was a pattern that took place as well for Quebec. We did this for two different jurisdictions, two different sets of, of data sources. Um, and what we found is our ability to predict for was very materially enhanced by using this, quote, lower quality data source in addition to the higher quality one in both cases. And once again, it was something that informed our ability to predict forward using both those data sources, and the impact of model accuracy was huge. I'm going to talk about a slightly more sophisticated model now, uh, one that's also published, also in PLOS One, um, with particle filtering for measles. Okay, um, This work was uh, done using data publicly available on pre-vaccination era, but we're currently updating a related model for the vaccination era. And the empirical data sets that we were operating off of here were measles and separately pertussis, although I won't talk about it here. Um, glad to share slides if there's interest. In, um, and then we had data on um, the Saskatchewan age, uh, age structure from 1921 to 56. This measles model um, uh, actually spanned several variants. The most basic is susceptible, exposed, infectious, and recovered. And it appears in this paper by David Earn, um, Peshman Rohani, and uh, Brian Grenfell, some of whom are uh, Peshman we, we work with in some of our particle filtering work. Um, excuse me, some of our um, uh, uh, pertussis uh, ABM work. So um, it was characterized by a set of, of basic uh, compartmental equations given there as differential equations. And there was a version of it that was also um, uh, created for two age groups here. Uh, children denoted by C and adults by A, okay? And, and so we had one version that was aggregated. So we had just one susceptible category, one exposure category, one infectious part, uh, category, one recovery category per particle. So each particle had one value right now for susceptibles, for exposed, infectious, and recovered at a given time. Each particle posits a situation for that. Um, whereas for this other model, each particle posited things about, for each of those, how many children are susceptible, how many children are, 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 are adults are susceptible, how many children are exposed or adults are exposed, et cetera. Okay. Um, and, um, and there was a mixing matrix, which represented um, children to children um, transmittivity, children to adults, adults to children, and adults to adults. Okay, now, very importantly, as in the previous model, where we had the propensity to search evolving stochastically, or the presentation uh, probability per, per unit time evolving stochastically, here we have uh, a set of factors that are stochastic. One of them is just the transmission process, which we modeled as Poisson. 
But um, we also had noise or, or uh, stochastics associated with two other components. One is reporting rate and one is transmission uh, rate. So the basic idea is we argued that there was a slow change over time in transmission or contact rates and, a sl and, and some, uh, some slow change associated with um, contact rates, or excuse me, uh, reporting rates as well. Okay. So the idea is that rather than putting all our eggs in a basket of one reporting rate, we allowed this to evolve. Now you may ask, why do we allow it to evolve? Well, there's really two reasons, if I'm to be honest about this. There's two reasons we allowed it to evolve. Um, one reason is we thought that over the period of time, 21 to 56, 1921 to 1956, probably the contact rate did evolve over time. Moreover, seasonally it evolves. Schools open, schools close. When it comes to contact rates, child to child, probably that has very material impact. Um, similarly, reporting rate over time, uh, Saskatchewan economy transformed uh, from being very agricultural and dispersed to being increasingly urban, and probably there were awareness changes and uh, changes associated with ease of presentation to, to physicians. So the reporting rate was probably changing over time. So there's probably some genuine evolution there. We also wanted the model to be able to have a requisite breadth of variety of its predictions across particles to account, to be materially um, informed by new observations. And so we saw, we wanted it to have a certain, a certain degree of diversity in the particles. And this is one way to, to have some diversity of the, the, the parameters of all. But the third way that I'll emphasize is that, um, these stochastics associated with, uh, with parameters also allow the model to learn about parameter values. Because normally it's learning the values of the state variables, the latent state. That's what particle thing lets you sample. It's learning about the latent state, S-E-I-R. But by making these part of the state of the model, these factors here, making them stocks that evolve stochastically according to flows that are stochastic. We can actually, if the model, call, model learn about parameter values, which is all what M, M, PMCMC relates to, is learning about parameters. So, so we added these to the state variables, essentially, and, um, and we used, once again, a negative binomial likelihood. Interestingly here, we have data once a year, once a month, data across the whole population and the number of measles cases. It wasn't broken down by age, just aggregated data, crude and simple. And it's since right, if memory starts to be. Um, but once a year, we had data that was broken down according to uh, age categories. So to take advantage of this, Basically, we had two different likelihood functions. For each month, we used a likelihood function that only incorporated aspects for the entire um, uh, the number of observed cases over the entire um, um, population for that month. And, um, and it took into account the, the particle state. For this is for the particular particle. Um, by contrast, on yearly basis, we had likelihood functions for the child and adult that were additionally multiplied in. Um, and uh, those took into account the, uh, the age-specific observations. Okay. Um, so we compared in this paper a traditional calibration approach where we had a model and we gave it all of this data over this entire period and we asked it to tune its parameters to best match this data. So we, we said, okay, here's this model. Go off and try to match it as best you can in the traditional way. We adjusted its parameters, okay? And we said, try to, try to match this data. And this is what it did. This is the blue here. And you can see the model has this 
inevitably this move towards a sort of equilibrium state, endemic equilibrium. And it does okay for matching, but it's, it's not very compelling. By contrast, this is a particle filter over time, where the particle filter is each month being corrected. And you know, once a year it gets data broken down by age groups as well. Um, but these red dots, which I don't know if you can see, because they're so overlapped with blue, the model's really good. Um, these red dots reflect empirical data. And so what's happening here is that each time a new dot comes in, you know, the model distribution of possibilities across the particles get updated. Remember? We multiply the weights and, and model of particles that are highly consistent with the new datum. Their weights are increased. Those inconsistent weights are decreased. This is survival of the fittest. Particles that are inconsistent with the evidence die out. Those that are consistent are multiplied. And what it leads to is a model that tracks very closely these observations. And, and that's great, but this is for the entire time. And we're looking at the posterior distribution here. Let's see what happens when we, we imagine that we're at a certain time and we look forward, right? We've only seen the data until now and we try to predict forward. So um, I should say that the model, this, this model here, um, if we stopped at any one time, of course, we can sample because this is not curve fitting. We're not curve fitting here. We are updating the entire estimate of the model underlying state each time we get a new data point. So we can look at the latent variables and, and ask how many people, uh, how many kids are likely infected or how many adults are likely infected at any one time. These are the latent states over time. That, that reflect this. So you get this kind of latent state. This is how many children were likely infected, or likely susceptible, recovered, infected, uh, exposed, um, and this is for adults. Okay. Um, but like a weather report, this is being kept constantly abreast. What, what I wanted to talk about now, though, is this whole fact, okay, where we're, we're going to be where this red bar is, okay? This red bar represents, as it were, the current time. I'm showing two different ones, one at the top and one at the bottom, okay? And here, we're at this certain place. It's about time 50, I don't know, 55 or so. Do you see that up here? And the model's learned. It's been honed by. It's been shaped by. It's been informed by the data prior to this time, 55. And it has to predict what's likely coming up. And you can see that the model believes pretty strongly that there's likely to be an outbreak in the next little bit. You'll notice there are these black dots. Those black dots are, the model's blinded to it. It hasn't been told about those black dots. Those black dots are in the future, as it were. Um, we haven't told the model in any way about them. It, it, there's a, sort of a cross-validation situation, right? It, the model's been trained on this data, as it were up to this time 55, this other data is held in advance. It's, 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 it's used to, to cross-check the model's predictions. And that's what the black dots are. And the model's batting on. There's going to be an outbreak here. That's, you know, it, it predicts this, this outbreak is occurring. Same thing with down here. Let's look at time 150. And you'll notice the model predicts this outbreak is likely to occur. It's not sure how big it will be. You know, uh, some of those particles think will be a kind of small potatoes thing. Some think it'll be a larger thing. But you can see this kind of shape of an outbreak. Interestingly, this one's anticipating probably there'll be another outbreak after that. And this gets to the underlying model, ladies and gentlemen. This is where you have to start really thinking about what's going on about that model structure. For example, this, this top graph, why would it think there's a second outbreak at time 100? Well, you know, if it posits there's an outbreak here, what's going to happen is if there's an outbreak here, it's going to drain the number of susceptibles, right? And, it's, and it predicts there's going to be a low a valley in number of susceptibles, uh, sorry, and, and number of susceptibles here, and number of infections that result. It's actually a whole swack of, of black points here which it's bang on and predicting. And then it thinks, well, if it's drained the number of, of um, uh, or if there's a, a period of low, low infections here, it probably means there's going to be, uh, you know, buildup of susceptibles and a second outbreak. 
let's consider what's going on down here around time 150. Okay, we've observed all this data till time 150. And one thing you may observe is, um, in the, it's predicting, you know, in coming months, a high likelihood of some sort of outbreak, however big. But in recent months, before time 150, you notice it's had very low incidence, very low number of infections. And if this were a curve fitting exercise, if it were trying to match purely um, the future based on what it's observed, you might think there should be few infections going forward. But it actually thinks there's likely to be a big outbreak or a sizable outbreak. Why? Well, look. Time 150, it's observed successively very few infections. What's happened, if we want to think mechanically, what's happened during the particle filtering in these times leading up to time 150, where there were consistently almost no infections? What's happening is that in the model, there's a diversity of particles, right? Some are saying, I think there's going to be a time 145, lots of infections. Others are saying, no, oh, there's going to be very few. The particles that posit in the time leading up to time 150, in the year or two before that, very many infections are probably those that posit there's, there's quite a few people infected um, uh, to infect them, right? Um, by contrast, those that are positing very few infections here um, are probably positing few infectives right now. But one thing that's going to be clear is that all of those positing very few infections in the time leading up to 150, the only the logic of the model is such here. The, the, the stock and flow structure of the model is, if you posit very few cases of people going on to infection, you're going to, of necessity, have to posit people backing up here and, and particularly a build up in the number of susceptibles. If very few, over time, you're seeing very few people grow infectious, it implies the number of susceptibles must be growing. It must be growing because people are coming into here through birth, right? The underlying model gives you no choice. If you're seeing very few infectious cases, Either it means people are building up and exposed, which is only a state that lasts for like a week or so, less than a week, or people are building up and susceptible. So all those particles that are being selected out that are, that are the, the, the highly competitive ones, those particles that are the, the, that survive, the highly fit ones in this time leading up to time 150 are those that posit low, number of infections consistent with the empirical data. Those are the ones that are being rewarded. All of those have to, of necessity, be positing a growing number of susceptibles. And because of that, because they are positing a growing number of susceptibles, they're increasingly going to predict a coming outbreak. Because they, they posit there's more and more fuel, more and more tinder on the ground, more and more kindling for a coming outbreak. Right? It's the nature of the logic of the situation that observing very few infections here in this model for these particles, which are all instantiations of this model, they have to imply a growing number of susceptibles. Now, I come back to that point of intuition I talked about earlier. Observing things that one part in a system often whispers to you about the broader system. So observing very few infection, new cases of infection is whispering to us about the number of susceptibles. It's telling us the number of, if you're seeing month after month after month, very few infections, it's telling you the number of susceptibles must be growing. There ain't no two ways about it. You must have a large number of, of, of susceptibles that are growing. And so when we think about the systems informed data science, here we're measuring something about this flow, but it's telling us something about what's going on here. And indeed, it's that logic, that you know, inexorable logic that allows it to predict forward. And 
And it's really something, I, I like to use the analogy of a CAT scan or an or a MRI scanner. I don't know if you know how these work, but if you consider a CAT scanner, you've got this torus. And basically, when you go into these uh, images that are being taken at you through various slices, through various angles, and each image is very limited. It, it, it has occlusion from bones and from the, the ways that the rays are, are blocked. It has limited field of view, uh, et cetera. But it's really when you join them together into a consistent image, that's when the real power happens. And that's really what's going on in this model. You have these, these data sources coming in. In the case of that flu model with fear and infection, it was you know, search data, um, so search volumes over time and clinical cases. Um, here is monthly and then yearly cases broken out in different ways, but they give a picture of what's going on in the early uh, in the model at a given time. So if we're here at time like 260 or 250, it's given a picture of what's going on across all of the different stocks of the model, the different state aspects of the state of the model, and then we can predict forward in light of it what's likely to happen. Here's another case. So here we're, we're just prior to this. There's been very few cases of infection and it's predicting forward the occurrence of an outbreak. Um, and here it's in the middle of an outbreak. It knows there's been this, this rise in number of cases. And the only particles that are going to multiply and thrive at this point are those positive large numbers of infections. The only ones positive large number of infections are those that are inevitably drawing down the number of susceptibles. And so it captures bang on the number of cases going forward as it drops down. Okay. After that, looking further out, after about a year or two, it's increasingly uncertain, but it thinks there's an envelope somewhere in here, but it's not able to predict the exact timings of, of say, these, uh, these outbreaks. Um, and this is towards the end of an outbreak where it, it's, it's coming down. Um, so we compared multiple models and so on. This is one of the more compelling things that came out of it. This is an RZ probe, Zebra operating characteristic probe. Some of you may recognize. Here we're comparing the ability of a model to, to predict when there's going to be an outbreak in the next month. And a model that is perfect would have uh, for almost no false positive rate an extremely high true positive rate. And as and and essentially it would it would have no suffering of the true positivity rate um, to lower the false positive rate. So it would, it would be immediately up to here. And what you can see here is that there's a bit of a trade-off. As is characteristic, as we capture with receiver operating characteristics. If we're willing to trade off some false positive, saying, I think there's going to be an outbreak when there's really not. If we're willing to cry wolf, as it were. You know, there's going to be an outbreak uh, with 10% probability where there's not. We can actually get a true positivity rate of somewhere around 67% um, uh, or 65% here. So in other words, we can predict there's going to be an outbreak uh, in the next month with 65% likelihood. We can identify there will be one with 65% likelihood when there actually is one if we're willing to have 10% of the time we're wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, alternatively, if we're willing to have be wrong 20% of the time, we can predict 90% of the time when there will be an outbreak in the next month. This is a, a very sobering thing because it's actually telling us we can do a pretty good job with very simple models for predicting whether there's uh, going to be an outbreak. <clears throat> Now, one of the most exciting components of this, though, has to do with the application to uh, what if questions. So, many of everyone here will be familiar with GPS applications. And one of the most valuable things about a GPS system, of course, that sets it apart from our early reliance on directions 
is the fact that directions really didn't take into account the evolving situation, right? There were directions from A to B, and if you got lost along the way and you were somewhere off, you're no longer at A, you're not at B, the directions, how can you use the directions? Because they were relative to A, right? Um, a GPS, it takes into account where we're actually at, like part of the right? Takes into account where we're actually at. And then it tells us where we need to go to get to where we want to go. And so it is with particle filtering. Particle filtering is not only correcting our current estimate of where we are, but it's telling us where we have to go, you know, make this turn, make that turn, to get to the destination we want to get to. So for example, using this, having reached this place, we can then ask what if questions. What if we were to undertake, for example, a quarantine intervention? How would that affect things going forward? Um, and can do so with pulse portfolios of our choosing, recognizing that we're evaluating them in light of the latest evidence, in light of our current understanding of what's likely going on in the system, and in light of updated understanding of what's likely to be if we don't intervene, okay? Um, so um, this is a bit of a, of a picture here of um, uh, the use of, of interventions. I will note, and um, I think I'm going to uh, ask Lujan to do a bit of a demonstration um, here for this component. One of the biggest uses we see for particle filtering models at a practical level is to take advantage of their streaming compatibility. I actually have a set of slides that I provided to you, which I won't be going into, but I'm glad to talk about. And the idea here is that, look, these, um, uh, these models that we've been talking about can be placed into a decision support system over time where new data is coming in from, number, from a wide variety of sources. We've looked at data, for example, from, from Twitter, um, from search volumes, from web scraping. Uh, and we uh, have further integrated some, some models, uh, particle filter models, early on, as I recall, with um, data from uh, our systems like Ethic, which is this uh, smartphone-based data collection system. Um, uh, Luja has also done some further uh, looking into um, additional sources of, of data here. But the idea is that using particle filtering, you can actually make use of streaming data sources. So whenever a new data point comes in, whether it's search data, or whether it's through uh, Twitter mentions, or whether it's aspects from scraped web pages, so number of clinical cases reported by a given emergency room or what have you, you can then uh, grab that and place it into a particle filter model that then integrates it and looks forward. So um, Luci has done some great work taking uh, a variant of the model that I've provided to you and, um, and meshing it with incoming data um, that's gathered catch as catch can, as new data comes in, and where that model is then updated and projected forward. Luce, do you want to um, show that right now, or would you prefer to do that after a break? Uh, let's do after a break. Okay, that, that's great. So I'd like to uh, offer people a bit of time. Um, why don't we take, if we could, a, a quick uh, five to 10 minute break now um, uh, for you to use washrooms. I'm glad to answer questions in the meantime. Uh, we'll take a look at Lujie's demo, um, and we will uh, further uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the practicalities of using uh, particle filtering uh, in terms of tuning the models. Okay. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. It's terrific. I'm doing something that's very manual mm. in the same space.